started and here come our folks. Good afternoon, Groves Academy. My name is Kim Ani. I'm the Transitions Advocate here at Groves. I'll take a moment to introduce myself while we wait for all of our participants to file in. I want to thank you, um, staff that are here to present today, but more and more importantly, thank our parents for submitting questions ahead of time and for taking time out of their day to be a part of our all school town hall as we get ready to start an unprecedented school year. I know we hear that term a lot, but it is unprecedented. Um, in thinking about the start of our school year, I've been at Groves for 12 years. Uh, I feel like I'm putting on a life jacket this year um, just to be safe and just to be ready as we're going into waters that aren't necessarily unchartered for us, but um, we'll have a lot of turns. We have excellent leadership. We've been working hard all summer on preparing our COVID-19 plan. And that's really what we're leaning on today. It's been released to all of our parents. We're here to answer your questions and take those questions as we move through today. How does that work? So we have questions that were submitted. One of them was, will we be recording this? We are and then we will make it available to parents that aren't able to attend today, or if you do have to depart early and wanna come back and hear the rest of what went on today in our town hall, that will be accessible to you. So thank you for that question. We got one of those checked off right away. We also have different staff members. We'll move through introductions for them. We have a brief presentation to go through. Many of the questions that were submitted by parents are a part of the presentation. However, we recognize there may be additional questions. If you're new to a Zoom format, you float your mouse towards the bottom of your screen. There's a Q&A, there's a bubble there. You can click on that and type in a question. And then I will work to facilitate that and get it to the right person when we get to the Q&A portion of our presentation. That doesn't mean you can't ask questions as we move through. However, recognize some of them may be answered as we present. With that, it looks like we have a pretty good number of our folks are in and about ready to go. Um, without further ado, I would like to kick everything off. Ms. Peoples will be sharing a presentation with us, and we'll start with introductions. The first person on our list to be introduced is Dan Morgan, president of Grove. So Dan, take it away. Thank you, Kim. Uh, I, I love that you have been uh, officially designated as our presenter for these webinars and town halls, so thank you very much for doing that. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Dan Morgan, uh, and I am the president of Groves. I am really, really excited to see just how many people are joining us this morning. We know that uh, this year will be full of questions, and we'd like to get a, ahead of as many of them as possible right now. And we know many, many more will arise during the course of the year. So thank you very much for joining, uh, and really excited to hopefully see you in person one of these days really soon. Ms. Peoples? You are on mute, Ms. Peoples. Well, it would be helpful if I unmute myself and then I jump the gun to boot. I am Kim Peoples, head of school, and it's such a pleasure to have this opportunity to connect with you via Zoom to answer any of your questions and assure you that we're excited to have your students come back and join us in a couple of weeks. Thank you, Ms. Peoples. Next, Assistant Head of School, Colin Roney. Unmute before you talk. Hello, everyone. Um, as Kim said, my name is Colin Roney, the Assistant Head of School. Uh, just so glad and so excited to have everybody um, you know, back in the building here soon and very, very um, excited uh, for, it was gonna be, I think, a great uh, start of the school year. So um, again, I wanna echo what Dan and Kim said. Um, I uh, don't want to repeat it, but just uh, I know we're going to have a great year um, and just really excited uh, to see um, all the kids back in the building for sure. Thanks, Colin. Next was Director of School Operations, Curtis Olofsson. Hey, good. Hello, everybody. My name is Curtis Olofsson. This is my uh, 14th school year. And like Kim and Colin said, we eagerly anticipate uh, students and families returning in a couple of weeks. And it's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you, Curtis. Director of Curriculum, Ellen. Oh, 
everybody, and thank you so much for coming to join us for this town hall. I'm Ellen Engstrom, the Director of Curriculum. I just want to let you know we've been working hard all summer to make this year, which is unprecedented, as Kim said, but also special for all your children. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. And Director of Human Resources, Deb. Hi, I'm Deb Peterson, Director of Human Resources, and I've been um, uh, helping out with the planning all summer long for back to school and just really excited for a great year. Thank you, Deb. Our Director of Facilities, Todd Olson, will be joining us eventually, um, so we will watch for him to enter when he gets here. With that, I'm going to turn everything over to um, Dan. Go ahead. Thanks, Kim. Okay, so uh, hopefully everyone did get a chance to read through the entire plan, uh, and in there are many, many details, but when we built our plan for returning to school, we absolutely wanted to make sure we had some guiding principles. And principle number one, sort of really our, our, our touchstone for everything that we were doing is making sure that we are protecting the health and safety of all of our students, all of our families, and all of our team as our first priority. And balancing that with providing an impactful and transformational learning experience. Those really are guiding principles as we are launching into the school year and as we are doing so in person. Uh, we will closely adhere to Minnesota Department of Health, to the CDC, Minnesota Department of Education, and State of Minnesota guidelines for operating a school. They do have guidelines uh, across all of those, <coughs> excuse me, different organizations. Uh, and we are following them while we are making differentiated adjustments specific to the unique needs of our school, our teachers, our students, and you as families. Uh, and that's true for Groves Academy, that's true in our learning center, and that is also true for Groves Literacy Partnerships, which is all three uh, of the different divisions at Groves. Uh, so all of this is outlined in the plan, uh, and of course, it's all subject to change based on the changing landscape of the world, uh, and also the changing landscape of our local community uh, and what's happening uh, within Groves itself. So I want to thank you in advance for your patience with us, with your, for your flexibility with us, and for your partnership with us. There's never been a year uh, where we have needed your partnership more so than this year. We are going to be communicating back and forth quite a lot this year. Uh, and we really look to do that in a positive way. We expect that uh, coming from you as well. Uh, and we are excited to have your partnership this year. So those are our guiding principles. Thank you very much, Dan. Before we move on, if permissible, um, Todd Olson, Director of Facilities has joined us. Todd, could you introduce yourself real quick to our parents? Hello, I'm Todd, I'm the Director of Facilities. So I've, I'm the lucky one is involved with everybody else. So. Fun, fun. All right, thank you, Todd. Also, I see a lot more parents have joined us since our introduction. If you've just jumped in, there's a Q&A at the bottom of your screen. If you're new to Zoom, you can float your mouse down there. How many of you submitted questions ahead of time that are part of our presentation? If other questions come up, we respectfully ask that you type them into the Q&A. We'll get to them um, as we move through. With that. Right. I'm going to move into our key safety decisions and non-negotiables. It's what we're going to have in place to assure that we're doing all that we can to keep our environment safe and healthy so that we can fulfill our mission. So all family, students, and staff are expected to adhere to the details of our safety plan. Key among our details, stay home if you are sick. Um, families will not bring their child to Groves if they are sick or showing any symptoms related to COVID-19. Faculty and staff will also stay home if they are showing any signs related to symptoms related to COVID-19. A lot of times we like to push ahead, persevere, and move forward. That's the culture that we're in. But this time, this year, at this moment, we have to ask you to take care of each other by taking care of yourself and staying home when you're sick. Some other key non-negotiables for us. Everyone must follow all the following protocols. 
Face coverings are required every day by every person in the building as mandated by our governor. Promptly identify and isolate sick persons in the building. There is a whole uh, section in our plan that talks about uh, the procedures we use in following that. If you've not had an opportunity to read the plan in depth, please, please, please do so. Practice social distancing. People must be at least six feet apart. We have markers, we have other indicators to let us know when we're six feet apart and we'll also rely on each other to do that verbally as well. Follow hand hygiene and respiratory etiquette. There are hand, uh, hand sanitizer stations in all of the classrooms. Uh, we ask that we you know, wash our hands on a consistent and regular basis and that will become a part of our classroom routine. And for um, respiratory etiquette, that good old put your nose in the crook of your arm and, and cough or, or, or sneeze, those things are gonna be very important for us now. And Kim, so, I thought I would introduce this slide really quick please. just to say that we had a number of questions once the plan was sent out in early August, a number of questions came back that were frequently asked questions. They were very common. And we responded to a few people, uh, certainly answering their questions as quickly as we could. But we also wanted to make sure that we took some of those questions and were able to answer them here. So that is what you see here on this list is what were some of the most common questions that we got uh, once the plan was released. We know there are more questions than just these, but we're going to go ahead and start answering these now directly. Uh, and then we will take more questions from there. Uh, so, uh, I know that the first question was going to go to Colin, uh, yeah. so Colin, why don't you jump right in? Absolutely. Thank you for that, Dan. appreciate it. Um, so, um, uh, we, uh, will we, parents and child, be seeing a physical change in the building? So, um, yes, we, we had the, the luxury and the privilege to have summer school here this summer, and it went extremely well, um, and we're able to um, use all, all the different logistics and, and things in our building to uh, kind of, I don't want to say pilot, but sort of test out, um, you know, what we're going to be doing this fall. So when your student arrives, um, you know, it's going to be the physical changes is where you get dropped off. There's going to be three different uh, drop off locations to, uh, to um, you know, to expand social distancing as possible. Um, when your students come in the building, there are stanchions. Uh, which is something that I learned, the, the technical name for stanchions, like you see at an airport, um, or you're waiting in line at the movies. Um, so we have stanchions all over our building, dividing the, by dividing the hallways and creating that physical barrier to help students realize um, to, to keep social distancing. Uh, we have uh, markings on the ground as they come in, uh, depending on what grade there are, um, so that they know the traffic flow and where to go. Uh, we have spaces marked out um, for drop off and pick up those types of places uh, with X's on the ground that are six feet apart um, to maintain those, uh, th those guide to be within those guidelines. We're also going to have um, all of our staff and, and, uh, um, and extra staff, every adult in the building helping during unstructured times to ensure social distancing uh, during drop off, pick up, after school, um, you know, lunch, uh, recess, all of those things to make sure. Um, that will be incorporating that. So uh, as well as the, 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 the physical changes in the lunchroom, uh, there are some barriers on each, uh, on each lunch table that will separate uh, students um, to give them some separation there when they're eating and drinking in the lunchroom, um, as well as um, other signs all over the building, um, signage that will remind students about our expectations. Um, so the physical change, changes of the building again, will be visible and will are, are pretty self-explanatory, but are there to help prompt them um, so that we're all following uh, what our expectations are. Um, about moving around in the classroom as well, the classroom, uh, we have uh, Todd and I and other teachers um, and other faculty and admin have uh, spent a lot of time measuring each classroom um, and mapping out each the optimal uh, seating arrangement for each classroom. We again have the privilege um, to uh, able to have a huge amount of space uh, in each classroom. 
um, to be able to have uh, six feet plus um, uh, in each classroom um, with, uh, with social distancing. Each classroom will have in, in every, uh, in, in the hallways as well, have a physical uh, pump um, for them to uh, use to uh, sanitize their hands. So those have been installed all over the building and in each classroom. Um, water stations, water fountains will be shut down. Um, and that's why we're asking parents to send a full water bottle every day. And the uh, students will also receive, um, this is a surprise, will receive a, a water bottle as well, um, a Groves water bottle as well um, to have that. So sending two, even two full water bottles to minimize um, refilling them during the day uh, as well. Um, other uh, uh, things that are in the classroom, we'll talk more about the sanitation piece later, um, but those, but those uh, are available as well. So a lot of uh, changes, um, but again, um, many change, changes that are, that are still welcoming. And it feels like a school, it feels warm, it feels like groves. So it, it's not a place where it's scary or feels uncomfortable. We spent a lot of time um, really thinking about uh, what we want to do and what it looks like because Groves is home and it is our it is a, it is a family and so it feels like home and we want to keep that as well. So um, again, if you have any questions about that, please let me know. Peoples, how will back to school night work this year? And I would just add really quickly to um, Colin's great response that for parents, if you want to actually see what it looks like, you've given a great description, a great time for that would be either August 31st or September 1st during the new student and previous student orientation, the times that we're gonna set up um, with individual families and their homeroom teachers or advisors. Uh, specific details about what that looks like will um, be shared with you on Monday and Tuesday of next week and how to sign up for that. But parents, this will be your one and only opportunity for some time to actually come into the building. So after September 1st, we're going to wave at you from outside of the building and greet you in that manner. So to actually come into the space, your last opportunity would be September 1st. So if you're able to register for that, please do so. Now going to the second question, how will back to school night work this year? So back to school night will in many ways be similar to what we've done in the past. The only difference is that we're doing this through Zoom. So you'll have an opportunity to connect with your students division directors. They will host a Zoom where you can talk with them and they will share important information about the division and plans for the division for the year and just things that you need to know. Uh, you'll also have an opportunity to meet with each of your students' teachers as well as their advisor through, again, So it's the same concept. Difference is that we're doing it virtually instead of being together in person. And more specific details about that are to come. Uh, the next question is directed towards um, Colin and Curtis about measures in place to maintain social distancing during morning drop off and afternoon pickup. So Colin talked a bit about social distancing while we're in the um, school day. Um, can you elaborate a bit on that for everybody? Sure, I'll start and then I'll, I'll let Curtis uh, uh, fill in too. Um, so again, with uh, uh, morning drop off and, and afternoon pickup, um, you'll be receiving maps about where to drop off and pick up uh, your child. Um, there, that's in this in the plan that we sent out as well, uh, with a more description. Um, but you'll be receiving receiving very specific for you car tags, where to go, um, and, and where to pick up. Um, when you're dropping off your your student, um, they will there will be areas that are uh, designated uh, for them, whether that's the gym. Um, uh, the, the lunchroom, depending on what division they're in, the lunchroom or the media center uh, with staff in there as well. There'll be more staff outside to help space um, uh, students as they come in um, and to make sure that they're not bunching up together. Um, and then when they're in the building, again, that increased um, uh, monitoring uh, and proctoring from faculty 
uh, and staff uh, will be there as well um, throughout the, from when the moment they walk into school and outside of school. Um, for lower school students, um, again, um, they'll be spacing in the gym with different um, tags on in areas where they'll stand uh, in the gym to can maintain social distancing until they're picked up and teachers will be down there to monitor that until they're picked up. Uh, we had a lot of practice this summer and it went really well, extremely well. Uh, we we're really pleased. Uh, and with the, with the three different drop-off points, uh, it, made, uh, it made it extremely smooth and, and actually quicker um, than, than the normal year. So excited about that opportunity as well um, to uh, continue to uh, in, increase uh, our logistics and, and just the flow of traffic on our property. Um, so that's, that's what we have in place now. Um, and Curtis, anything else that, that um, is worth mentioning that I missed? Well, thanks for the for all the for all the details. I, I was going to say summer and touch on where in the first couple of days we just like like we said at the beginning, ask for your patience. But after experiencing summer with a reduced amount of traffic, um, I, I, after a couple of days, it's it was really a seamless process, and we're excited to to get that figured out together. Appreciate your support with that. Um, and then again with the drop off, this where we we do have again free. Uh, before care, supervision, and after care for families that need it. We're requesting those only who needed to sign up. And I did send out instructions and, uh, via Amy last week, and you'll be see, receiving more information as, as others have described too. So be on the lookout. But really at 8.15 is the drop off time. And with our three staggered uh, points, it should work well. Dismissal again, uh, with the staggered with, with at 250 upper school leaving a little bit early, there is a smaller division that should allow the flow to keep things as normal as possible is kind of our overarching goal with everything. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's about all I have to add to that. Colin and Curtis, a, a question came through about uh, how a family should drop off if they have uh, multiple students at Groves in different yeah. divisions. Yeah, no, I, we had a couple of those situations and I'll even add on a second thing is carpooling. We have a lot of families with our counties and districts that rely on that. And Amy Luffy, who many of you know, but if there's any new families, um, she's our student services coordinator and, and her and I and Colin worked very closely with day-to-day -day school matters. Um, but yeah, we would, we would ask in those situations to reach out specifically, we can address that individually. But we do, we, we can find a solution and we have, we have been working through that. As Curtis said, we'll find a solution that works best for you log a lot logistically and time-wise, and that works best. So you'll get a personal touch from Amy, Curtis, or I about that, and, and we'll make sure that we're all on the same page and that you're feeling good about the plan. And would that also apply? We have another question about um, students that, are, that do register to stay uh, for aftercare. What would pickup look like for that? Do they need to call or when they're out front how are we going to manage that curtis or Colin? yeah yeah and and whether there is a form which we what we're requiring now unlike what we've had our early release wednesdays where we suggest give us a time we, we really want you to hone in on a 15 minute window to just give us a good idea uh, based on things and how things have signed up i'm not anticipating a massive um after school traffic and before you know as far as inside the building like we're all used to so i'm confident using that main entrance will be very feasible with the support steps that we have in place but again, please refer to that sign-up form, and I'm also including that in a, as a reminder in an upcoming school communication at the end of the day today. So please be on the lookout. Excellent. And Curtis, the next question is uh, to you as well. Um, Colin talked a little bit about the physical changes of the lunchroom, but what will lunch look like? Yeah, and I, we really, it's again, keeping things as normal as possible. Really the big change is we are not doing hot lunch service uh, this year and and uh, we can explore that later, but that the plan is to be box uh, lunch, excuse me, box lunch only uh, through <clears throat> through at least the fall. Um, chef Chuck, our, our wonderful chef, chef, will make sure that all those box lunches are you know appropriate and nutritious, and the kids will eat them, but also expand upon that as we go. There will be instructions, excuse me. <clears throat> uh, there will be instructions in, in this communication today about how to order lunch and how to sign up. The actual space itself will be physically distanced. Colin can elaborate on that if I miss anything, but we have barriers up and we plan to operate um, as normal as possible. And with our middle and upper schools, uh, we will have to rotate students uh, with capacity um, restrictions. We'll have to have some kids eat in classrooms. Um, all of those details will be figured out, but we 
with the input of faculty, of course, uh, don't report until next week. Thank you, Curtis. Um, not to bog you down, but this is in your direction as well. But <laughs> Colin can jump in too. Um, so talk a little bit about what recess and breaks at school will look like. And then we did have an additional question along those lines um, from a parent about gym class. Um, and it's their understanding they may or may not have masks during gym class. Um, can you just kind of talk about those more open large group times and what that looks like? Yeah, Colin, why don't you go ahead with this one and I'll, I'll, jump, I'll add on anything. Sure. So um, that's, that's a great question. And looking at um, the, what other uh, best practices are and with the CDC right now, we are going to have students wear masks during uh, recess and breaks um, across divisions because um, from what we know, the CDC says if a student, even outside, if a student was, is, is within uh, less than six feet, um, we want to make sure that that students aren't considered exposed if anyone were to uh, contract COVID um, because then that would create a big problem as obviously out on the playground. So um, we are going to require that um, until we uh, get other information from the CDC um, that states or Minnesota Department of Health that states otherwise. Um, and again, going outside um, is going to be heavily staffed by teachers and making sure that students are being six feet um, as they walk outside. Um, and that includes like drills, like fire drills and other things like that, that we're thinking about uh, working with our fire marshal. I work with talking with the fire marshal too, to making sure allowing extra time for that uh, and allow planning and preparing around that. Um, uh, and uh, so I hope that answers your question there. Um, um, and again, as we get other information, as the year goes on, those policies might be adjusted or changed, and we will communicate that with you um, as well so that you, that you know and you can continue to have those conversations with your students at home. Still bring their Curtis, own bag lunch, else? correct, Colin? I'm sorry? Students can still bring their own bag lunch, is that correct? Correct, correct. Yes, That's a great yes. Question. sorry. Right. Yes, good. sorry. To clarify that online, you can order lunch this year. To start, it's going to be a very, it's going to be a box lunch, one option only. We may expand upon box lunch, bag lunch options, depending on how many people decide to elect to sign up. Chef Chuck will have some more uh, samples. I think he's going to have some during uh, the orientation day. So again, more to follow. If I could say one thing about lunch, and I and I know as a parent I have three little boys, and so that's that's like the most important one of the most important parts of their day, right? So they're going to have questions about that. But with lunch, um, we're not going to have students lining up uh, in lunch, and 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 uh, as they usually do, they will just come into the uh, lunchroom and they will have a, a a seat that they sit at, um, and then their lunch will be delivered to them to um, minimize. Uh, uh, you know, standing in line or getting too close and, and helping to encourage that, uh, that six feet at all times. So um, they will be, uh, the, those box lunches that Curtis is talking about from Chef Chuck will be delivered to their, to their, um, to their table. Um, and we're working on all the other um, policies um, that work around that when teachers return next week to any other details that, that we wanna go through. Um, and there will be, and there will be what what ifs and and what are we going to do and, and we're really in good shape to um to meet all of those questions and demands okay thank you uh one last lunch question <laughs> then we'll move on um it is a big deal so um we have microwaves in the lunchroom are those going to be available to students that are bringing their lunches That's a great question. That's something that people have been asking about and we have to talk about that. Um, I'm gonna be working with Todd uh, on that as far as uh, disinfection and, and he'll, Todd will talk more about disinfection uh, in a little bit um, uh, and the products that we have, the new products that we have that um, I'm very pleased with um, uh, the dwell time around that. We have to figure that out. Um, I will we'll give you an, a better answer probably in about a week after we talk with teachers again. Um, that might be a possibility, it might not be, but we just, we really have to think about what that looks like. And it might be um, teachers helping with that um, and that kind of thing where they, a teacher helps during that time, heat up um, some food uh, for the student or, or someone's assigned to doing that or helping that uh, so that we can maintain um, 
you know, unmitigate any, you know, uh, germ, you know, spreading of, of anything. So uh, more information on that. That's a great question. Thank you very much for taking the time to really dig into lunch there. I know it's, um, it's important. It's really yep, important. Absolutely. It's large mass times of students. Yep. The next question um, here is for Ellen. Ellen, um, it's looking at uh, question six. If my child has to quarantine at home due to illness or exposure, how will they keep up with their schoolwork? Okay, that is a, uh, that's a great question. And we have spent time uh, considering that, thinking about that. And um, so that, um, first of all, all divisions will use Google Classroom this year to, uh, so that all assignments that provide, Google Classroom will, will provide um, a place for students to get assignments online and to turn work in online, um, also to get materials and so on um, online. So that will be available to students wherever they are, as long as they have an internet connection. So um, if a child has to quarantine at home and that child or student is well enough to work, um, perhaps they've been exposed, but they're not sick, so they have to quarantine, they will be able to keep up with schoolwork through, uh, through getting assignments through Google Classroom we will also have um, we will also have a laptop uh, in the classroom for these students so that they can follow along with what's going on in their classroom through Zoom and even participate um, in uh, uh, in discussions and so on that are happening in the classroom. We also plan that um, when a child is out that there will be a, a student in that class who will be a sort of buddy and the job of that student will be you know to to check in with the with the student at home and keep them up to date um, to the extent they can uh, then in addition to that um, teachers will check in with the student uh, once during the week and then i will be overseeing um, any, any learning that's going on at home um, during quarantine or remote or where, and whenever. So I will be the point person if you have concerns about, um, and uh, uh, <clears throat> if you have concerns about that, you can, um, you can contact me and I will uh, help Help, help you to problem solve that with any kind of confusion or whatever is happening. So we will, um, through check-ins and Google Classroom and communication, we will make sure that students have the opportunity to keep up with schoolwork um, uh, while they're out, as long as they're able to do the schoolwork. And while we have you, um, a couple questions have come in that are really specific. Um, will children be wearing their masks during their Wilson reading lessons? That's a good question. We spent a lot of time this summer talking about Wilson and, um, and how, how teaching and learning will go on. Um, first of all, we have reconfigured the groups, the group. Uh, <clears throat> the physical configuration of the groups, which as you know, are small. So the children, uh, students will be sitting at desk, desks that are six feet apart. And they will be wearing masks as much as possible. Uh, and what will, uh, what will, uh, what we'll do is to, uh, there are a couple of possibilities, and frankly, we're still working a, some of this out a little bit. Um, there are masks that have clear sections across mouths. We're looking at that. Uh, there's also the addition of face shields, which in and of themselves are not sufficient protection for other people, but, um, but for a short period of time, they do, uh, they do protect uh, the students. So 
there may be a short periods during the Wilson lessons when students will pull down their masks um, <clears throat> to say words and so on. And so that's that's where we are. We're, and of course, there will be individual situations that we will deal with on a case by case basis as well. Excellent. Um, thank you very much, Ellen. And this room and the use of that. Um, some parents are wondering if there's going to be any type of tutorial that can be offered. I know that varies so much from person to person and division to division. Um, any thoughts on that? Tutorials, what kind of meaning while a student is 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 home? Or in a sense is what they're trying to get at is, um, you know, everybody has different capabilities. Uh, how much guidance can we give to a parent that may oh. need to assist that, that child? Well, we will have our response to intervention teams working so that we will still be progress monitoring students and uh, referring students for RTI support in both lower and middle school. Um, and that will happen, you know, pretty much as, as, as normal. Um, so there will be uh, individual work for reading and math to help support a student. And that, and that, that will be much as we've, we've had it as part of the Groves Literacy Framework. Excellent. Thank you, Ellen. I'm sure there'll be other questions as we move through, but for right now, sure. let's move forward to, um, this is coming up a lot too in the Q&A. So what is the option for 100% remote learning? And I know there's a lot involved in that. Ms. Peoples, do you want to um, start to tackle that for us, please? Well, I'm going to start in response to the question, and then I'm also going to ask my wonderful colleagues to also add their perspective as well. Regarding a 100% option for remote learning, uh, one of the drivers for us in creating our plan for reentry to Groves in the fall is that we understand what works best for our students. Opportunities to be in person, to receive direct instruction, to receive direct feedback, and for teachers to be able to sense and to understand immediately from a student what their needs are. And again, that's best gauged in, per in, in person. Uh, and it's a part of what makes our secret sauce at Groves is our attentiveness to the needs of each of our students. Now, certainly, um, you know, with uh, that particular perspective and, and viewpoint, there um, uh, may be uh, situations in which it would be a, an ideal opportunity for us to engage in conversation if there are some concerns. Um, so my uh, response to parents, if you have a concern or if there's something that you would like to further discuss as it relates to remote learning, to get in contact with me. Let's have a conversation. Let's discuss what's happening. Let's talk about again, the benefits of what we do at Groves and how we do it, and how that particular idea played a major role in why you've enrolled your students at the school. Uh, so I'm gonna turn it over to some of my other colleagues to respond. Maybe Dan, you wanna chime in, and then perhaps Ellen. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Kim, I appreciate it. Yeah, this is a very complex issue for a school like Groves and uh, the teachers who have specific expertise and who work at Groves and the students who come to Groves and their specific in individualized and differentiated needs. And to some extent, frankly, also the science behind how you teach neurodiverse people and how you teach people with unique learning profiles. And there is strong relationship between the in-person component and driving success forward for the future. So that, all of those things put together uh, were some of the main reasons why we chose to be in person for the vast majority uh, of our school week and our school year. I know that there are a number of other schools, uh, in fact, almost every other school, public or private, that are looking at hybrid options that are more of a hybrid than what Groves is doing or complete 100% remote learning options. And there are a lot of differences between Groves and schools like that. And, and one of the main differences is that for the most part, those, those schools teach kind of right down the middle. 
right? They have a specific curriculum and they teach straight down the middle, but at Groves, we don't teach down the middle. We teach this way and we teach that way and we teach this way. Uh, and in order to do that best, as far as how we see it at the moment, and by the way, this is just how we see it at the moment, we believe that that in-person learning is going to be most powerful. And that's why we are not offering a 100% remote learning option at, at this stage. We do understand that there could be an opportunity for kids who are on quarantine, uh, as it may be, to potentially zoom into the classroom. But please understand that zooming into the classroom, if there were five or six, well, you know, if we have a classroom of eight and there are four or five kids zooming into the classroom, that really changes the dynamic of that classroom and what is being asked of the teacher. Uh, and it's not to say that that's not, that that is impossible to do. It just means that that is something that at the moment we think would be disruptive to the way that we want to teach. So we are exploring the opportunity to do that. We're exploring the possibility of doing that. At the moment, we are saying that uh, for kids who are on quarantine, they have this asynchronous model, the way that Ellen described it. Uh, and if you have a specific concern about this, please do talk to Kim. She is prepared to have a conversation with you uh, about remote learning right now. Um, and understand that we will be flexible whenever we need to be flexible. Uh, and we are capable of doing that. And there was, uh, I did see a question come through uh, that asked about, you know, what it would be like the criteria for changing the model uh, or doing something different. And do private schools have to do the same thing that public schools do uh, under the governor's order? Uh, and the answer to that is private schools do not have to do the same thing that public schools do. Under the governor's order, we, we do not. However, we will be paying very close attention. And if there are St. Louis Park public schools, for example, that are shutting down for one reason or another, that would be a trigger for us to say what is going to be in the best interest of Groves. Uh, and we, but we do have the capability of making that, that call on our own. Uh, unless the governor comes back with a statewide mandate that says everybody has to do what he is saying to do, including private schools. And then the governor does have the power to do that. So uh, we will be paying close attention and we will be monitoring what's working best for our students uh, in the classroom and or students who may be at home. And we are able to make pivots pretty quickly, especially based on what we learned over our summer program and over what we, over what we did during the springtime with distance learning. If, if we are mandated to shift to 100% distance learning for 100% of our students, we are able to do that. And actually there was, there is that plan in the plan that we sent out. So you can see the description of what that would look like in our plan. And as Ms. People said, does anybody else have anything to add? Um, any other uh, members of our panel? Ms. Ellen, looks like you're- Yes, um, I, I just wanna add that, uh, uh, that if you look at, uh, I know, you know, it's, 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 uh, you look at schools that are sending kids to school twice a week and public school systems and so on, and you wonder, you know, how are we able to do four days a week and so on. And there are a couple things there. First of all, in those larger districts, one of the things that's part of their hybrid plan is that uh, that, that students who are on IEPs and have some particular, uh, have a particular kind of learning profile um, tend, to be, uh, tend to be going mostly every day, if you look at that, because there's recognition that students who uh, learn differently need uh, a lot of consistency in their instruction to make it effective. Um, and a lot of practice and so on. And so it's, uh, you know, and that's something that we took into account uh, greatly as we looked at our uh, model for the, for this year. And the other thing is, is that we have done a tremendous amount of work over the summer that uh, to, to, uh, that would, to, to integrate technology into our uh, curriculum so that we have a kind of a blended learning model that would then um, enable us when we, if we did go at 100% virtual, uh, would make it a much better experience for students and teachers than, than we had last spring when we were kind of in crisis mode. But one of the things we really wanna do is start open so that we can teach students 
uh, how to use these tools, how to access them and use them as part of their learning so that they would be able to do it too um, once we are uh, in 100% remote learning, if in fact that happens. So just wanted to uh, add those uh, things. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Um, Curtis, did you want to jump in a little bit about the uh, after school care and then we'll move on to the paper copy question? Yeah, not to the divert things, but these, these are important topics and very, very good opinions. But two things. One is there, there was a question about peanut uh, free tables or lunch, or can students bring um, uh, lunch or items that contain peanuts? The answer is yes, we will find a solution for that. We've always historically had. Uh, peanut free tables and accommodations. We just don't know the specifics at this time. And of course, we will make those and uh, ask that you communicate those needs appropriately on that student health form uh, that's required to fill out. Um, we also have had a question about aftercare. And, and similarly put, for those that are new families, uh, returning families know about ASA, where we have robust, fee based um, art classes, elective classes that were led by teachers. This year, Due to COVID, we are, we are just trying to limit as many people after school as possible. So our numbers, we will likely divide them based on obviously how many people sign up, but use areas such as the gym, um, the health room, which is an auxiliary space near our lobby. And it probably won't have more than eight to 10 kids total in two or three locations. Uh, we will probably divide those up age appropriately and depending on energy and all that stuff, like I said, we'll get more to that. But just so you all families know, um, aftercare, again, it's not, it's free of charge for families that need it, and that is from 315 to 5. And then those of you who are interested in sports and activities that uh, Peter Schutte has communicated out, that's a separate thing that, um, that, that again, refer to that information. So thanks. Hope that addresses your question. Curtis, just to be clear, traditional ASA that, that people understand as after school activities uh, and for new families as well. That is canceled, at least through Thanksgiving, correct? Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out, Dan. I should have mentioned that, too. We have made this decision. So the forms that you're signing up, if you need this before or after care, will be effective through Thanksgiving. And at that time, between now and Thanksgiving, of course, if we can offer more robust programming, we will add it. Obviously, if we subtract, we're prepared to go, you know, to, 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 to pivot as needed, as we've, others have described. Thank you for asking that, Dan. Excellent. And we were talking about the um, paper copy of our plan just prior to starting our, our Q&A session today. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we landed that all requests for a paper copy of our plan should be routed to Paula Sundberg, correct? Yes, Kim, that's correct. Yeah. I, well, interestingly, I got a number of requests for a paper copy as soon as we released the plan. Uh, and the answer is we can get you one please send your uh, name and address to Paula Sundberg uh, and her email address would be sundbergp at grovesacademy.org uh, and she will get you a paper copy. Uh, and Kim, I just wanted to address question number eight in just a little bit more detail. I know I mentioned that Groves would shift to a full distance learning mode if we're mandated to or it, it is very clear that uh, all other districts and all other private schools are going to uh, distance learning uh, plan. There also are within the governor's mandate specific guidelines and uh, benchmarks for the number of people who are infected per 10,000 within the county and that's kind of what we will be watching as well to see it locally how that uh, how that's happening and if they exceed those benchmarks then we would likely need to go to a full distance learning model. And then I also know that that question is probably asking about well how many kids and teachers can you tolerate being quarantined before you have to say that you need to go to 100% distance learning? And the answer to that is, I don't know the exact numbers yet. It's very difficult for me to say because I don't know that everybody would go out all at the same time. It might be one teacher here and one teacher there, or a few kids here and a few kids there. It's very difficult to say what that would look like. Uh, but I know that we will be feeling the stress of that very quickly as soon as we start to see teachers uh, who are being quarantined or numbers of students who are being quarantined. Uh, and Kim and the school team will work with myself uh, and Deb and our health team to make that determination. And what I can promise you is that we'll be communicating that very clearly and very quickly as soon as it seems like that's going to become the case. 
Um, so beyond all the benchmarking and other things that are happening around us in the world, uh, at our school, we will be monitoring that individually. Excellent. Um, looks like we're ready to move on to the next slide, which is um, primarily for Deb Peterson. Uh, some health and safety questions. So Deb, you're up. All right, thank you. Um, so some of the questions here are around um, protocols and quarantining. Um, so what will happen if, um, you know, how does the whole uh, contract tracing and um, all of that work? Um, so if, um, if a student or staff member is diagnosed um, with COVID, we would immediately start the process of um, uh, doing the, um, the uh, contact tracing and, uh, and to identify who is a, co a close contact of that individual. A close contact is, is um, identified as someone who's been within six feet for 15 minutes or longer of the person who is sick while they were considered to be infectious. And uh, generally that's within 48 hours of, of when they show symptoms. And then uh, individuals who are considered to be a close contact will be notified um, of the exposure and given guidance on how to protect themselves and others around them. Um, uh, people who are identified as a close contact would then need to monitor for 14 days, uh, quarantine at home, and monitor for symptoms of COVID-19. Um, the um, resources that we would access is through the Minnesota Department of Health and through Minnesota Department of Education, um, they've, and as well as the CDC. Um, and we work, work closely on them on stepping through this process and including the notification. Um, the next question talks about what happens if one uh, child, um, it happens if one child or the teacher in the classroom tests positive, will the uh, class have to be uh, quarantined for 14 days? Not necessarily. If we're doing our job at, at keeping distance and wearing masks, um, we would again, um, we would not require the entire class to quarantine. We would go through that investigative process, identify those close contacts and identify and notify them to uh, quarantine. Um, and then what happens if someone is, uh, goes home ill during the day showing COVID-19 symptoms? So uh, first off, what happens is um, our teachers, if they uh, identify someone who is experiencing uh, symptoms or is ill, they will notify our health office right away. The health office will come and get them um, from the class and take them to, as they're taking them back to the health office, they will, um, be uh, diagnosing if it's um, COVID related or not. If it's COVID related, they will immediately isolate that student, call the family, um, and then stay in close contact with that student and the family um, to uh, monitor their progress. And if the student or the faculty member is positive, then we will go back to that contact tracing process. Okay, Deb, there's some other questions. I know you hit on this a little bit, but um, to really firmly um, land on this, um, there are questions around um, confirmed cases in the building and how we're notifying. Can you reiterate that? And there's some question around, um, so my child has a fever, can they not come to school? Could you um, put some clarity around that mm -hmm. for us as well? Thank you. Yes, yeah, so um, as far as uh, notifying, uh, so when we go through the process, we will reach out individually to anyone who's considered to be a close contact. Um, in the past, I think that we notified uh, just in general, um, if there was a case um, that was, um, that we had a positive case, but that we would also let individuals know if, if they were a close contact, they'd already been reached out to as well. Um, we will not, um, uh, the, the individuals uh, who is uh, uh, positive with COVID, we will keep that information confidential uh, as per the laws out there. Um, and then the other question was about, I'm sorry, I forgot the second part of the question, Kim. Uh, so the symptoms, um, if my yeah. child just has a fever, yeah. uh, you know, the list, I think we yeah. have a, an actual number on that list. Um, talk a little we bit do. about that. We do, and the, and the list um, does go through, and the list is, is by the Minnesota Department of Health, and on that list it talks about if you're um, uh, getting up in the morning and your child has a new uh, cough, 
or shortness of breath, that alone is enough to stay home with symptoms of COVID. But then there's other symptoms on the list as well. Fever is one. And in general, um, we will still follow regular uh, health guidelines for students. And I, I believe a fever is one that you would keep your child home anyway. Okay, thanks, Deb. I, I know there's the, as we move into the fall and listening to these questions and or seeing them come in, um, this will be a continuing discussion. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I know we're communicating quite frequently with families. Um, continue to ask these questions as we get into the nuances of, of illness and what that looks like as we move into the fall. So um, if we have an answer today. It could change a little bit in three or four weeks, um, depending on what types of things we're hearing from the state. We're trying to stay on top of that and keep communicating that. But thank you very much um, for all of that. I believe now we're ready to move to Todd and facilities. Um, and Colin, you're part of this as well. Yes, okay, so the first question they asked, we've had a few things um, people have brought up about our ventilation system. Um, and uh, we have uh, made modifications and are continuing to um, monitor those and, and see. Every time you make a change to a rooftop unit, um, it changes other things too. So we've increased our filtration um, to, uh, to, to better filter the air as it's being recycled. It, we've also increased the percentage of the dampers opening position to draw in fresh air. Um, when you change that um, and you increase your filter, it reduces, puts a strain on the rooftop unit. So we've increased our fan speed to keep up. So we have the same amount of air coming in, um, even though we're filtering more. The other thing that we will be um, and, and it's recommended to do if weather permits, as we, we will still encouraging opening of, of windows in the classrooms. Um, and that, that's been important. And then they did say to just, you know, using common sense, uh, you know, weather permitting and comfort, you know, we still have to maintain um, uh, humidity and, and all of that in our building too, to, to be able to, uh, to be comfortable, but um, that, that's a benefit that's added too. Um, cleaning products, um, we did uh, change to an Ecolab um, product. We, we were able, we had the opportunity to have a scientist come in from Ecolab and um, we looked at what we were using and the benefit of their product was that they had a peroxide based product that had a dwell time um, of, of 45 seconds versus a 10 minute dwell time of having to put disinfectant down that dwell time, you have to wait for that to work. So 10 minutes versus 45 seconds. So we made that change. Um, and additional preventative tools and cleaning sanitation processes. Um, what we've done is we have added a, a staff member um, that during the day does continuous rounds of all the high touch point areas. So those those areas would include things like the front doors, um, break room countertops, uh, drinking fountain push buttons. Now, we don't allow the drinking fountains to be used where you put your mouth. We've shut those down, but um, we still have water bottles that get filled. And anytime you, you know, every lot of people touch those. So those are being disinfected. You know, restroom door push pads and, and that, those items, stairway handrails. All of that is being cleaned. And what we found um, having the opportunity to run summer school was very educational for us because we're prepared now. Um, we can do a round in, in about an hour um, to hit what we need. And so we're able to continue that um, into the school year now. That's fantastic. Thanks, Todd. I don't really have anything to add to that except as Todd said, meeting with the scientists and uh, collectively, um, uh, most of the administrators were in that meeting. Uh, it was very educational and changing the 45 second dwell time and the rounds and the amount of cleaning and the, the frequency of the added staff uh, is huge and it worked really well this summer, as Todd said. So um, very excited about those details and thinking about that and constantly uh, thinking what that looks like as far as not only the, the high touch point areas, but um, classroom teachers having that product in the classroom 
um, the, the, in the lunchroom, having that for the table, uh, tables as well, and anything that's in the classroom uh, to be disinfected to when there's a change um, of students or sitting uh, before school, after school, those types of things as well. So uh, again, uh, the product will be in each, in each room in the building um, uh, and uh, there's be training around, around uh, using those products as well. Thank you very much, Colin and Todd, especially. I, I can attest um, being in and out of this building this summer, Todd and his team are working meticulously on um, getting us ready um, and cleaning. And again, we have, we, we have the gift of having summer school in with students this summer to really help us understand how much cleaning is involved and how much management of movement of people is needed. Many thanks. Uh, Dan, did you have something to add to that? Well, I just there were a couple of questions that have that have been coming in uh, that are very specific to things like ventilation. Uh, and Todd, I know that you uh, have also been working with the ventilation system. You've got it running pretty much continuously now, so the amount of air that's moving through the building is significantly higher than it was before. But there was a question specifically of we are moving fresh air into the building and filtering. It's not just solely recycled air, correct? Correct. We, there, it's a mixture. So air is drawn out of every room in the building through a return air duct. It's, it's just called return air. So that return air is brought up and mixed in with fresh air and filtered and then reintroduced to the building. So it's constantly being uh, moved and filtered and recycled and, and added to. And that is being done, uh, Todd, if I recall correctly, you'd mentioned to me some time ago on a 24 hour basis, right? It's constantly working, not just during the school day. Right, we're, we're leaving fans running um, all the time uh, right now. So um, that's, that's what we'll continue to do as, as we need to. It's very, really, it's really hard on your equipment. It, you know, it, it's, but it's what we need to do now. So that's what the, the choice we've made. Great. And I know there was also a question about, do we have an ionization system attached to our, our entire system? And the answer to that is no, uh, we do not. However, uh, Todd and I have been exploring the possibility of potentially doing that uh, at some point during this year. It's a complex issue and we have a very big building. Uh, and so it takes a lot of equipment to do something like that. But uh, we will continue to explore that. And if it turns out to be the right thing to do, then then we'll, we will jump on it. Okay, Kim, that was, that was it, just a couple of specific things there. Very good, and uh, moving to the next slide, I have some lead-in questions to, um, I believe most of the policies and procedures are gonna be directed towards Colin. Um, Colin, I'll, I'll let you go through these three here and then see if I need to add on any at the end. I think you might hit on a few that have been coming in. Go ahead, Colin. Perfect, thank you, Kim. And um, as Kim said, uh, it, it's laid out in the plan very clearly. And as Kim stated, you know, students will be required to wear masks all the time in the classroom. The answer is yes, um, with the exception, like Ellen was saying, if they if they have a shield on or during Wilson, um, certain times to, to make those movements. But again, that's for a very short period, controlled period um, for that. Um, and, and we're going to continue to working around that, uh, working with teachers, uh, working with Ellen and the other experts around that. Um, to mitigate those things, but uh, yes, uh, students will be will be uh, wear it at all times, except for when they're eating and drinking. Obviously, I uh, can't wear a mask during that time. So, uh, if there's a time where they need to take a quick drink, that's that's fine. Um, when they're in the lunchroom, uh, we're coming um, up with different ideas during the lunchroom when they how they take their masks off, um, the potential, the possibility of them maybe taking their mask off and putting it on a napkin, so to speak, or a, a paper towel or something like that. We're exploring all those options um, of what that looks like to maintain optimal sanitation as well. Um, so the mask, yes, even during break and lunchroom and during PE, um, that again, if it's outside, if they can maintain um, a social distance where it's highly supervised, um, the PE teacher is going to uh, be controlling that as well. Say there's a game where everyone is 10 or feet apart or even more, um, um, that might be a possibility. And of course, if there are specific situations um, where somebody has asthma, a hard time breathing, we will work with you and that teacher uh, to address those situations and, and, to, and to find a solution for that. Um, so we're, we're gonna mix in um, our hard fast rules with 
the specific needs and accommodations that your student may need. Um, um, why can't I be told who has the symptoms or tested positive for COVID-19, child, student, or staff? Um, um, I'll, I'll answer that and I'll have Deb uh, chime in too if I, if I missed anything. But again, the laws around confidentiality, just like we do at Groves for academic purposes and things like that, there are separate laws that, that protect people's uh, medical, um, uh, medical um, uh, um, information. So we need to be able to keep that um, confidential as well, but you will be notified. There just won't be specific names uh, listed, uh, but there will be information on there uh, that you will need to, to make uh, decisions uh, and so that you feel uh, as formed as, as possible um, when you're talking with your medical provider, or whoever else around that. Um, do you have anything else you would want to add to that? Um, no, I think you've covered it. Come on. Okay, and the last before, one. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say, Colin, um, I, not to jump on you, but there are some questions um, that really kind of dig into this before we move forward. Mm -hmm. uh, some questions are coming in about self quarantining. Um, uh, one parent very nicely said, you know, are we just relying on everybody um, on an honor system to um, avoid large gatherings and travel? Um, yeah. Either Deb or you, can you address a little bit of that before we get into the school year? We're coming into the final weeks of summer. Um, thoughts about that? Um, I'll, I'll start and I'll have Deb chime in too. Um, you know, it, it comes down to trust um, at the end of the day. You know, you trust us to have your students and you know, we trust families and again, we're a Groves family. And so we have to trust that parents when they're sending their child to school, um, they're going through uh, the list that you will get received shortly that, that our summer school families have too. Um, the, the medical um, health screening questionnaire that you're going to go through uh, with your child every day before they go to school. So, and they have to answer, you know, uh, all of that has to be good to go for you to come to school. So we're going to have to trust families that they're that they're giving us that the the best information possible. Obviously, if a kid comes to school sick or something is missed, um, the nurse Kelly, along with the teacher, will be you know working with that student um, and the parents too to say you know they're not feeling well or whatever, and, and that needs to be addressed here at school. And there's those policies in place that we talked about, um, but again there's a big trust piece to that um and um great question about you know are we trusting families with with traveling i can let deb answer that but you know uh we're trusting that families are making really good choices and really good decisions um about uh, what they're doing outside of school to keep their family and students safe um so in turn they're safe when they're here so deb you right. have uh, correct. And, you know, as far as travel goes, we are following, you know, this, what the state of Minnesota is, if they uh, currently, they don't have any restrictions on travel, so we are following that as well. Um, and as you said, Colin, we're just really trusting and then also working with your student um, to make sure that they are maintaining the, the social distancing and wearing their masks properly and, and putting those precautions in place as well to avoid that close contact. Yeah, that's a great, that's great, Deb. And, and I think the most you can, more you can do, I have three little boys at home. My wife and I spend a lot of time on masks and wearing masks and what that looks like and not touching the mask. So that mask education that you can do at home, YouTube videos, you know, information from the CDC uh, videos and the Minnesota Department of Health on, on, on correctly putting them on and wearing them, what that looks like. You know, obviously you guys are doing that and have those conversations, but continue to do so. Uh, with your students at home. Anything else, Kim, before I go to question three around maybe that? The visitors, um, you know, I have two classroom questions. Um, one is uh, upper school. Will they be okay. using their lockers? I, I think they are, is that correct? That's correct for right now. There might be a situation where we go to backpack only, but we, division directors, when they return next week with their um, teachers next week, we'll be communicating that with you very, very clearly. So lower school have lockers, uh, the, upper, the older upper lower school kids do. Middle school um, kids have lockers and upper school uh, students have lockers. Um, lower school and middle school, um, they have a different kind of schedule with, with their advisory and homeroom teacher is much more controlled. So they can very much more control 
the locker situation and when students um, go to the locker. So that shouldn't be a problem there when talking with the division directors about that. Upper school is a little bit different. It's up, they have more freedom within boundaries, right? And so their schedule is a little bit different. So some students come at different times and, and are arriving and departing at different times. So uh, again, uh, division directors in upper school will be reaching out to you about the locker policy and about whether we're just going to go to a straight backpack policy or um, whether students are allowed to use their locker. But again, the older students, um, we know uh, and are trusting that they have a little bit more um, maturity, if you will, to, to follow the specific guidelines because there will be a lot more in-depth training with them about expectations and following expectations at all times. And that's not only to keep them safe, but all the other students, big and little, and you know, in between um, lower school, middle school, upper school students and that responsibility of modeling that to the rest of the school, so. If you have really specific questions about that, or it's, a, it's an absolute necessity for reasons that I'm not thinking about, please let me know or the division directors know too as well, and we can help you with that. Um, visitors, go ahead. Visitors, so this is a great question. So um, an exception, uh, uh, Kim was saying, uh, for the, uh, the 31st and the 1st, uh, you know, um, we will not have visitors into the building. Uh, the only people that will come into the building are people who have made appointments with Todd uh, for mechanical purposes, whether that's HVAC, heating and you know, um, plumbing, electrical, um, those kinds of service things. Um, they will have had uh, a pre-approval from Todd. Todd has vetted those pe people. Then they also have to come in and they'll be recorded and have to go through our safety checklist before they even come into the building and then follow um, all the other mandates that we have for them before they come into the building. Other uh, situations that might, um, besides that, would, would possibly be food delivery, but that would be before students are in the building. Um, and so, uh, again, that those people would come in be well before students would be early in the morning. Um, and uh, those will, are also um, screened and checked and documented as they come in and, and have to agree to following our strict protocol as well. Um, but as far as that, those are all the visitors um, that I that I can think of that would be allowed into the building. So um, extremely few, um, and not even parents, but there might be a situation where, there, uh, but that would be appointment only, and we would talk with that person well ahead of advance and have plans around that as well. Thank you, Colin. Uh, another question coming through is about the rotation of students in middle school. And I'd imagine if you have an upper school student, you're curious about this as well. So students, will they be rotating and um, between periods and then um, cleaning in between as well? What might that look like for a middle school and an upper school student? And that can really go to Colin or Ms. Peebles, anybody that's able to answer. Yeah. If, if someone else wants to talk about the schedule, then I could talk about the cleaning um, after that. Well, the student, students are, well, we are going to build in cleaning, but we, we have determined it isn't feasible to have students in the same room all day, especially in our middle and uh, across all divisions. So the schedule is still being formed as it is up until the last minute. And of course, division directors are taking into account minimal rotation of students, but students will, will be moving to different classrooms depending on how their schedule is. So, and then there will be time, which again, goes with our faculty workshop week, where we're very aware of <clears throat> how to build an extra time for that uh, to get things cleaned and re-sanitized for, for the next group. Hope that answers your question. Yeah, Curtis, that's perfect. And so they'll be doing that. And again, that 45 second dwell time and the product in the classroom and the training that we'll be doing with teachers that they've already know about most of the teachers and or continue training and um, their product availability with the C-full towels, uh, <clears throat> disinfecting any area that needs to be done uh, again, we have passing periods, so that 45 second dwell time works out great because that area that will be disinfected will be disinfected uh, in a, in, by the, the time the next student arrives in that area. Um, to that point, too, we're also minimizing, you know, students are not going to be sharing um, the, um, computers, students won't be sharing anything, um, you know, school supplies or anything, they'll all, all have their own. Um, so there won't be a need to decontaminate um, any kind of uh, supplies or things that are being used because they're all going to be their own. 
Um, so that's why also many of our students do uh, uh, utilize a backpack for, for that reason to keep everything everything organized. Excellent. Thank you so much um, for that, Colin, and everybody for everything. Um, I do believe we move into our pillars of curricular approach next and then can do some wrap up questions. Um, yeah, we'll take that to Ms. Peoples and Ellen. I just wanted to uh, bring to your attention and all the things that we're talking about, the very specific questions around health and safety and our practice. Um, very specifically what we're going to do in keeping each other safe physically. We also want to make sure that we are taking care of ourselves intellectually and that the purpose for our families, for our students being at Groves is enforced in the curriculum throughout this experience. And so to really drive home the importance and the foundational um, pillars that help a curriculum to thrive, We've specifically identified five pillars that or four pillars that will be an essential part of all of our students' curricular experiences. Uh, so starting with diversity, equity, and inclusion, given the uh, climate in our world today and really um, helping us to understand how important it is to look at the world, look at historical events, look at our current events through multiple lenses, we're doing a deep dive in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, also looking at our curriculum to make sure that we're including multiple voices, multiple perspectives, and therefore encouraging discussion and exploration along the way. We will continue to build on our executive functioning um, skills that are so integral in the success of our students in accessing curriculum and understanding how to be learners as well as looking at social emotional well-being, helping our students not only to be aware of themselves and how they're feeling, but how does that translate into your understanding how others are feeling. This is going to be a challenging time for all of us, but it's also an opportunity for all of us to grow together as a community and be connected as a community. So we will have opportunities for students to deepen their understanding of self, deep their understanding of connection with others. And there is a deep dive and purposeful integration of technology. I think Ellen mentioned it earlier that a part of our existing in-person model is the, the blended learning um, model, where we're infusing technology in all that we do so that it just becomes a part of our regular curricular experience and it's not new and it's not different, it's what we do. So if there's an instance where we need to go to remote learning uh, completely uh, because of the, the, the situations in, in our environment says that it's best for us to do so, we will be able to use the technology um, that we've incorporated in the classroom all along very seamlessly in a distance learning environment. And Ellen, I'm sure you wanna to chime in as well. Uh, you did a great job explaining it. Yes, um, I am very excited about our uh, <clears throat> about our technology integration. I think um, the uh, the kinds of tools which will be new to students and to teachers too, in many ways, will really um, you know are are very excellent means of engaging students and. Um, and giving them and empowering them in certain ways as well. So um, I think I might be more excited about that than practically anything else. <laughs> anyway, yes. Excellent. But we also have great, yes. Okay, anything, what else? Anything more? Well, um, I had a question uh, that I was curious about. I have seen um, plexiglass dividers in different locations throughout the building. Are they in every classroom or not? I can talk to that and I'll have Todd follow up too if I miss anything. Um, there are certain high frequency areas. Um, as you can imagine, John, um, our guard, John Moore, um, Mr. Moore, our guard, uh, we wanna you know, keep uh, those areas safe with, with Amy, uh, Paula, uh, people in the main office, Nurse Kelly, um, 
these are our frontline uh, uh, workers, if you will, in our building. And um, you can only imagine, as you guys know, how crucial everybody is, but especially they are to the day-to-day -day function. So there are uh, encased or, or, or enclosed in plexiglass area to help um, minimize um, exposure. Um, not all classrooms will have that. Um, it's not uh, from what we know from what the CDC says to, again, we have the bigger classroom where we can maintain that six feet of social distancing. Um, our counselors will have it in their um, offices uh, if needed, uh, working with students uh, since they you know, may be working with somebody who's having a hard time and, and it's a different situation that way. Um, our learning center also has uh, a lot of uh, those with their clinicians, with their speech and language um, because of the nature of what they do. But um, uh, there, and, and again, the divide of plexiglass dividers in the lunchroom on each table as well. Um, so we have utilized it um, um, in those areas uh, and will add more if and when needed uh, to different areas. Todd, any, any other thoughts on that? Oh, I think you covered it. Okay, thank you very much. We're gonna to move to closing statements by Ms. Peoples first and then um, President of Gross, Dan Morgan. Uh, before we do, Ms. Peoples, I just um, personally wanna thank everybody for your questions in advance along the way. Um, and I, I shared with one of our parents here in the Q&A, um, we are here to answer your questions beyond one o'clock today. Please know that. And, um, and I know there will be other questions that evolve as we evolve into our school year. But cannot thank you enough for taking the time to be here and for your honest and straightforward questions. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it to Ms. Peoples. Thank you, Kim. And, and thanks to all of you for taking the time out this afternoon to be with us, to listen to responses to questions that you posed to listen to the innovative things that we want to do even in the midst of this experience. And I hope you get a great sense of the thoughtfulness and the care that's gone into planning our school year. Yes, there are lots of unknowns. There are absolutely reasons to be apprehensive and to feel anxiousness. But the, I, I would say the thing that we have in our favor is that we are a community that's dedicated and connected to each other. And as a dedicated and connected community, we need to stay informed, we need to stay communicative, we need to continue to work together. So as Kim said, any questions that you have, there are no great questions, there are no small questions. Every question is important. We just ask that you reach out to us, that we engage in conversation, and that we support each other in this very, interesting, troubling, but also an a time for opportunity. Kim, I couldn't agree more. I'm so appreciative uh, of everybody joining, families and staff. We just have so much gratitude for all of you. I do want to say a couple quick things. We do have a video coming uh, that will just show uh, just a quick snippet of what a day in the life will be like at Fusion. So be on the lookout for Fusion. Uh, for Groves, Fusion's where I used to work. Uh, for Groves, we have a, a video coming out. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. Uh, and uh, I do want to just remind everybody, we did have summer school uh, that ended a few weeks ago. Over 120 kids in the building every day uh, and over 30 staff in the building every day, following this plan, essentially. Uh, and while there were challenges and it was complex, it was phenomenal. Uh, it was a lot of hard work, but it was phenomenal and it worked out really, really well. Uh, so we, we have had a dry run at this and I feel very confident uh, that this plan is going to work out uh, for the vast majority of people for the vast majority of time. However, this is not going to be easy. The challenges here have complexities upon complexities and we have been working really hard to figure out every single one of them. And all of our decisions are really based on this idea of balancing health and safety with providing you with the powerful and transformative education that you have come to expect at Groves. Uh, and we are really balancing that. Sometimes one thing might outweigh the other and we will have to make decisions based on what we see happening in the moment, based on the current and most up-to-date science and information that is out there, uh, our expertise and the expertise of all uh, people who work in this field every day. 
Uh, we will do so by communicating, as Kim said, by connecting with as many constituents and stakeholders as we can, and then we will make decisions. And I'm sure that at some point, there's gonna be a decision that you don't like. Uh, we can't, I know that we won't be able to please everyone on every decision. All I ask is that you continue to communicate with us uh, in a positive and constructive way. We will continue to communicate with you always in a positive, constructive way. And we're gonna get through this year uh, together and it's going to be a fantastic year and we're gonna learn a lot about education. Uh, we're gonna lot, learn a lot about kids and you're gonna learn a lot about us. So uh, again, I just really wanna thank you for that. Uh, and I wanna thank you for all your time. And this is really, again, just kind of step one, maybe step two now uh, in our process. And, and please stay connected with everybody in the school. And I wish you a really, really nice week. Okay, with that, thank you. We can't say it enough. And um, we, I did have a question come in about will we be making a, a written synopsis of what we've done here today in our Q&A in our town hall. This was recorded. We will make it available to all parents that weren't able to attend and those that had to depart earlier for work and other reasons. So we will have that out there. Um, and again, thank you so much for your questions. We look forward to seeing you. Um, I mentioned at the beginning, I feel like I'm starting the school year with a life jacket on, which is okay, because I can do a lot and I love wearing my life jacket, but uh, I'm feeling comfortable as, as an individual working in this building. I hope you're feeling comfortable too. Um, we are here for you and we are doing this together in, in more than ever before, more than ever before. With that, that ends our, um, our town hall. We look forward to seeing you soon as Dan and Kim and everyone has said, um, staff, uh, you're asked to stay on uh, for a little bit and we will dismiss our participants at this time. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone. <laughs>